This summer, or fall, be prepared for the terror of piles of clothes and unmanned vehicles as one film portrays the worst thing to ever happen to planet Earth. Armageddon, I, I mean 2012, uh, uh, the day after tomorrow, the day the Earth stood st the happening? Uh, left behind again, too. Starring Nicolas Cage, Cat, Baby, Body. This is Bruce on Spirit Life, and I'm here to answer one question. Is there really a rapture? Well, the word rapture is from a Latin word that means to be caught up, and it's not exactly found in the Bible. But neither is the word trinity, which is very much a biblical concept. So is the concept of the rapture a true biblical one? Well, yes and no. It's definitely nothing like the Tim LaHaye Left Behind series. Hey, I like Tim LaHaye. I own his book, The Act of Marriage, on, well, you know. And I love Kirk Cameron. I love the way the master radio evangelism. And I like Nicolas Cage. Has there ever been a more meme-worthy actor than him? All joking aside, I don't take issue with the Left Behind series due to cheesiness, but because of bad theology. They portray something called the pre-tribulation rapture, which is a doctrine that says that before the tribulation hits the earth, every Christian will suddenly disappear, leaving behind a pile of clothes. Even if you are already naked. Okay, well, maybe not that part, but seriously, if piles of clothes are the sign of the rapture, my wife is going to be freaking out like every day. <laughs> the modern day left behind rapture belief was invented back in the 1830s by Margaret MacDonald, who had crazy unbiblical visions of a second and third return of Jesus. It was adopted and preached by John Darby and popularized by the Schofield Reference Bible, which presented this two-part second coming in the footnotes. I can see all the pre-trib fanboys already writing angry responses to this, saying the disciples themselves, or Paul, or some early church father or somebody actually believe that nonsense. But you know what? You're wrong. I used to believe the pre-tribulation rapture just kind of by default, until I actually read Matthew 24. I don't think any neutral person looking at the Bible for the first time would arrive at some secret two-part rapture where Christians disappear. It's just not in the Bible. I think today if every Christian disappeared, some people would not even notice. Others might call it an alien abduction or something, but very, very few would come to the conclusion, oh my gosh, this must be that left behind scenario all my friends kept trying to warn me about. Let's see what the Bible actually says about Matthew 24 and the rapture. Matthew 24, 21. For then there will be great tribulation, such as has not been since the beginning of the world until this time, no, nor ever shall be. And unless those days were shortened, no flesh would be saved. But for the elect's sake, those days will be shortened. Why would Jesus talk about the elect if we're not going to be here for the tribulation? Does he refer to some other group other than born-again Christians? Absolutely not. The same word elect is the one used in verse 31 to mean those getting raptured. It's Christians. And that's through the entire New Testament, like so. Let's skip down to verse 29. Matthew 24, 29. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light. The stars will fall from heaven, and the powers of the heavens will be shaken. Then the sign of the Son of Man will appear in heaven, and then all the tribes of the earth will mourn, and they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he will send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet, and they will gather together, that's where we get that word rapture, his elect from the four winds from one end of heaven to the other. Here we see that the rapture is a gathering after the tribulation. After the tribulation after. after I could probably end the video right here because it's after the tribulation but I've got a lot of great jokes I still want to put in the rest of the video besides I also want to point out that in this passage it says that every tribe will see Jesus. In fact, in Revelation it says every eye will see Jesus. He's coming on the great clouds of glory with all the angels, with a loud trumpet blast, 
the voice of an archangel, Jesus himself is going to shout. Nobody's going to miss that. Let's look at Matthew 24, 27. For as the lightning comes from the east and flashes to the west, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For wherever the carcass is, there the vultures will be gathered together. His returning is going to be as obvious as lightning that fills the whole sky. It doesn't say as quick as lightning Jesus comes back or in a flash everybody disappears. When it says that where the vultures are, there the dead body is, that's kind of like saying where there's smoke, there's fire. In other words, it's going to be obvious. You can tell when a bunch of vultures are circling around, there's a dead body. Jesus' return will be obvious. However, there's a misreading of 1 Thessalonians that makes some Christians think that Jesus will return like a sneaky ninja to steal away his people. Let's look at 1 Thessalonians 5. For you yourselves know perfectly that the day of the Lord so comes as a thief in the night. For when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. But you, brethren, are not in darkness so that this day should overtake you as a thief. The analogy to the thief is not about how swiftly and quietly Jesus might return. It's about how detrimental his return is going to be for those that are caught off guard. In fact, Jesus is going to surprise and catch off guard those people that are waiting to be magically whisked away. Jesus himself said, if somebody knew when the thief was going to arrive, they would guard their house and not allow it to be broken into. So Jesus' return is like a thief for those who are unprepared because it's going to be detrimental to them. So what about the two people in the field? One is left and one is taken. What's that all about? Let's look. Matthew 24, 37. But as the days of Noah were, so also will the coming of the Son of Man be. For as in the days before the flood, they were eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage until the day that Noah entered the ark and did not know until the flood came and took them all away. So also will the coming of the Son of Man be. Then two men will be in the field. One will be taken and the other left. Two women will be grinding at the mill. One will be taken and the other left. The people in Noah's day didn't realize the impending danger and they were taken, killed by the flood. Similarly, when Jesus returns, some people are going to be taken by surprise, taken or killed, and others will remain alive. Even if you think that this still applies to the rapture, it says nothing about Christians disappearing all of a sudden before the tribulation begins. Remember this? Let's briefly look at two more eschatological passages. 1 Thessalonians 4, 14 through 17. For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who sleep in Jesus. For this we say to you by the word of the Lord, that we who are alive and remain until the coming of the Lord will by no means precede those who are asleep. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel, and with the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And thus we shall always be with the Lord. Here we see that when Jesus returns, he'll bring back to earth the souls of those believers who already died. This is the resurrection of the dead, where everyone in heaven comes back to life. The rapture can't happen until after that. There's only one return of the Lord, and it's simultaneous with all the dead saints coming back and getting glorified. Jesus will return the same way he exited, by flying through the air. And we who survive until he comes back will meet him in the air, not disappear into thin air, as angels escort us up to Jesus in the sky, not in heaven. So again, we will not precede, we will not get raptured before the dead in Christ rise from the grave. 1 Corinthians 15, 51 and 52. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed. Christians who survive till the end of the tribulation when Jesus comes back get to be resurrected at the same time as the believers who have already died. It doesn't say we'll disappear in the twinkling of an eye. 
It says that we'll be transformed into our heavenly bodies at the twinkling of an eye. Oh, and by the way, the last trumpet referred to here is most likely the seventh trumpet of Revelation, the last trumpet mentioned there, meaning that Christians would go through the seals and the trumpets of the tribulation. I don't think these verses could be any more clear. I've simplified things for the sake of time, but still, you Objection! have to understand. God did not appoint us to wrath! That's right, we're not appointed to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ. This verse doesn't say anything about not suffering. It says that we're not going to have to face the punishment of our sins, which is hell, the ultimate version of God's wrath. Besides, in the book of Revelation, you'll remember that the seventh trumpet where we get raptured or gathered together is also when Jesus returns and we get resurrected, so we don't have to stick around for the bowls of wrath. Either way, if you're still clinging to the pre-tribulation rapture doctrine, you have to ask yourself, do you also support this American prosperity gospel that says that God exists to please us, rather than we exist to give God glory? The thing is, God does want blessings for us, but it gives Him greater glory and it produces character in us once we suffer. Anyone who wants to live a godly life will suffer persecution. For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake. Jesus said, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them within the world from the evil one. Hey, are you just proof texting? Yes, yes I am. But now let's look at the broad overall biblical narrative. God's story with humanity has always been one of, like it or hate it, suffering and overcoming temptation and trials. Look at the life of Job. Look at King David. Look at Paul. Look at Jesus himself. God's story with mankind is one of not just enduring passively or, or trying to survive, but triumphing over adversity, being overcomers in Him. That's why Jesus said, I speak these words to you so that you would have peace in me. Take heart, in this world you will have tribulation. But behold, I have overcome the world. With Jesus as our hope, we don't have to be these passive sufferers. We can actually be overcomers, triumphantly facing any kind of adversity, coming alongside others to help them, our other Christian brothers and sisters, and even non-believers, to show them the light. There's a fundamental misunderstanding about the end times. It's not all doom and gloom. It's not all about God's wrath against humanity. God is going to show wrath against the Antichrist, but even with humanity, the natural disasters are there to wake up non-believers and show them their need for Him. He would rather have them suffer for a moment to wake up to their need for Him and get saved than to spend all of eternity in hell. And in fact, it's that very thing that requires that Christians be there for the most epic conclusion of the best story ever written by the greatest author who ever was. The End Times is about the church rising up to be the equally yoked bride pure and spotless that God has always desired us to be. It's going to be the moment of the greatest purity, the moment of the greatest unity of all the believers, walking in power, manifesting God's glory. Christians aren't supposed to worry about God's wrath. In fact, just like the Hebrew people in the days of Moses, many of the plagues that God sends out won't even touch us. I believe there could be pockets of mercy like there were in the land of Goshen. A lot of the plagues that you read about in Revelation don't harm Christians at all. The thing that we need to be prepared for is persecution. But that's been true for all of human history. That's true today. People are suffering right here and right now, and they're standing up for the name of Jesus, and they're not backing down, even unto death. And who am I to think that I'm better than others that are suffering right now that I shouldn't have to suffer? God wants people that are willing to suffer for His name, who are willing to stand up for the truth of the gospel. A mentor of mine gave me some really good wisdom before he passed away. He had served in the war of Vietnam, and he described to me how differently people prepare for vacation versus duty. 
Let's not be the kind of Christians that are preparing for some cosmic vacation with a pre-tribulation rapture. Let's be the kind of Christians that are preparing for action, for service of the Lord. When we do that, we'll be ready to stand through any kind of tribulation, in fact, even the great tribulation, and be faithful witnesses. That's what the world needs. And that's the kind of partnership God wants. Because He said, whoever endures to the end will be saved. If you enjoyed this video, click the like button, subscribe if you like this kind of thing, and I'll be putting out some more soon. This has been Bruce on Spirit Life.